Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. So we've been on this uh, series called No Fear November. And, uh, and I, I've very much have been enjoying this because we've been talking about just the different angles of fear. We haven't been talking about like the typical fears, even though we did touch a few, but we, we talked about a lot of different things. And if you weren't here the first week, uh, then just go back and watch the live stream uh, and catch up with us. We're on our third week of No Fear November. And um, today we're going to do something very unique. And you know what? If you haven't been here for the last two weeks, let me be honest with you, you probably are going to get freaked out. So let me just set it up so that you don't get freaked out. Um, and, and once again, if you have not been here, trust me, go back. Have you guys been enjoying this series? Okay, good, good. So you got to go back, for those of you that have not been here, to understand where all this is coming from. We've been laying down foundation after foundation after foundation. We have to understand, first of all, that because we live in the earth, we, we live in this world, we can be so earthly minded that we sometimes have no spiritual maturity to understand where fear comes, comes from to begin with. I think what we do is we call it feelings, emotions, and, uh, and, and that's what we, we sum it up to, which there's some truth to that. Okay, so of course, we have feelings, we have emotions, and, and you know, I feel afraid, I think afraid, I, I, we, I get that. But let's get to the, the source of fear. If not, we'll never, we'll never be delivered. Now, uh, we've been reading this verse for the last, this will be the third week, uh, 2 Timothy 1.7. Let's all read this together, count on three. Ready? One, two, three. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. So this scripture is clearly saying that fear is a what? Spirit. It, it, fear is, though Though it, it, it um, what's the best word? Though it manifests in our emotions, in our feelings, in our thinking, but, but that's not the source. The source is the spirit behind what you feel. And until you understand the source of where fear comes from, or until you understand of the limited power that Satan has, called fear and, and I say limited because Satan is limited he has power but it's limited every say limited but we serve a God who has unlimited power come on he says I give you power I give you love and I give you a sound mind and so how many know that God will always trump Satan times three he'll always do that and so we have to understand that the fear that maybe you have been facing, that we have been facing, is not necessarily just an emotion. It's not just a feeling. But the reality and the truth is that there's a spirit that comes to torment us that keeps us from ever coming to this unlimited power that sets us free from whatever's holding us, paralyzing us, or toxifying our souls because that's where the mind, the will, and the emotions are, right? It's your soul. So the enemy will always come and attack that soul and and he deposits ideas and thoughts and and remember we talked about there's only two fears that got embedded in us when we were born i ain't gonna tell you go back and listen to part one but there's only two fear two fears everything else beyond those two fears are borrowed fears you borrowed it from someone someone told you something and you said wow really and then you borrowed it and then before you know it you borrowed so much fear you're in debt to it so, with that said, we put together a, a, um, a video with content and, and, and a clear message of how Satan defines fear. Now, this isn't to give Satan props or anything. No, this is, this is to basically take everything we've been talking about in the last two weeks and, and, to, really, and to really be straight up. and Because, you know, when you go to church, you just want to hear about how how you can feel better, but have you noticed that in church today, we really don't want to hear the truth? We just want to feel better about ourselves and then walk out of here, but nothing changes. So this isn't to, to, to like uh, promote the devil, but this is to expose the devil, okay? And I want you to watch this. I want you to put your Bibles away, like put it, because I want you to hear the content as we wrote this, as we uh, filmed this, 
our heart desire was to give people a picture of how Satan views his spirit. So without further ado, set your eyes to the screens, pay attention, and then at the end we'll come back and talk. Watch this. Along with lust, you've become such a valuable asset to us. You see, I'm in the process of expanding and I need a few more spirits that I can trust. I've been reading your resume for centuries and each day your influence grows immensely. I mean, you've been a mentor to terror, torment, threats, and anxiety. I love the way you carry yourself through society. It's like everywhere you go, people cry. <gasps> I'm scared. I'm afraid. Bad vibes. You've stood in the presence of a truth teller, sending chills up their spines, coding their words in lies. You've brought manipulation to many situations, rolling out the red carpet for hell's invasion. You prevent commitment to the right people, places, and things. You've suspended mankind in the state of a double mind about everything. <laughs> How persuasive. For example, you convinced Adam and Eve to run away from God when they ate from the tree because in your presence they could not perceive their father, just a wrathful king. Or how about when Israel would not receive the promised land promised to their seed because you were bigger than the giants that they would see. I'm wondering what promise you'll take from them as we speak. And my personal favorite, Gethsemane, when you challenged the Savior's love for his people in the shadow of the cross, bringing him to weep on his knees in the garden. And boy, it wasn't eaten, right before he would bleed. Along with doubt, you're the greatest killer of vision and dreams that I've had the privilege to meet. So many victors are close to victory, yet living in defeat. The right marriages can't unite because you hinder the faith and commitment it takes for God to break the chains of the counterfeit and the fake that you formed. You created the comfort zone as a cage for your slaves by which you are entertained as they groan and moan, like deceiving them of being too busy so they can't deal with the problems at home. You created the comfort zone as a cage for your slaves by which you are entertained as they groan and they moan, <laughs> like deceiving them, telling them they're too busy to deal with the problems that they have at home. You've become a noose on the necks of those that God loves and a yoke of oppression that settles in their bones. Fear, you are brilliant. There's so much more that I can say and would love to teach, but I'm getting a little uh, afraid. You see, God's children are rising in their identity, and if they accept the truth, it will set them free. So commit to making this No Fear November just another message that they won't believe. <laughs> You don't know whether to clap or to. <laughs> Awkward, right? Like, like you're. No, listen, listen. Let's thank our production team for putting that together for us. This isn't to promote Satan, this is to expose Satan. This isn't to promote Satan's unlimited power. This is to promote and show you his, his limited power in our belief system that we've created, right? And, 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 and here's the truth. God has enough power for every single person on this planet to completely deliver us from this spirit of fear. And we have to understand it. If we don't understand the, 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 the fear that comes to literally keep you from from becoming everything God's called you to be, you'll always just live in the same place with the same issues. Like remember last week, the seesaw, right? It'll, you'll just stay there and, and it'll be the same lifestyle, the same challenges, the same every, and nothing changes. It's just we're, we're so unbalanced. But fear is a powerful force and we have to understand that. And I think in these last few weeks, you understand that I've been making that very clear. It's a real thing. It can't keep us coward. It can't keep you cornered. 
As a matter of fact, fear drives us away from experiencing the perfect path that God has for us. As a matter of fact, you know what fear does? Fear will always get you to default back to what Satan has for all uh, uh, humanity, which is fear. But God created us by design, and that was designed to be people of faith. And Satan will always contradict the faith that you have inside of you. He comes for that. And I'm talking about, when I'm talking about the fear of, ever say commitment? That, that, that's what we're talking It's the fear of commitment. Um, I'm, I'm talking about going all in. Because I know that in every church in America, okay, there are wonderful, wonderful Christians that are in every church. But not everyone's fully committed to the gospel. Not everyone's fully committed to God to begin with. There's a lot of people that love God. They care about God. They, they, they believe in the Bible. But there's this lack of commitment. And the reason that we have this issue, not only in our world, but we, we also have it in the church, is because we think, we think that if we commit to something, then we no longer have options anymore. So what do we do? We start thinking this way. Let's not commit so that we keep our options open. And that's what most people do today, is that they'll go through life not wanting to be committed to anything just in case something better or someone better comes along, so we refuse to commit. But it makes total sense because we live in a society that applauds lack of commitment. Let's all applaud real quick, just real quick. Just, just appease me for a minute. That's what the world does. <laughs> Lovely. Don't commit. It applauds a lack of commitment. This, this, this world... The spirit of this world, literally, it applauds, the world applauds lack of commitment, lack of, com it conditions us to not commit. Let's just take uh, the new year. We're getting ready for 2019, right? Well, let's just take uh, the gym, for example. The gym already knows how people think, right? What, how, what goes on the new year's resolution? Lose 30 pounds. Go to the gym three times a week. Eat well. So you know what the gym does? They're like, we already know how they think, so why don't we do this? They put out these big old signs, zero down, no contract. And we're like, yay, I'm going to get a deal. And no, no, you're not getting a deal because they already know that you lack commitment. They know we lack commitment. And so what happens is as long as they're getting their money, they don't care. I mean, let's be honest. Some of us, we have gym membership, and we have yet to use it. How about prenuptial agreements? You see a lot of that now today in our society, right? Like, hey, man, we'll, we'll get together. We'll hook up. We'll link up. We'll do all those things. But let's make sure that we get this contract filled out and signed out and make sure we're, we're good. Leasing. How about leasing cars? Leasing apartments. You know, it, there's, there's this, this training that happens in us. This conditioning that takes place in us where the world is constantly teaching us how to have a lack of commitment. Do you agree with that? That happens to all of us. There's also escape clauses in contracts. I know because we recently just did a contract with a company and, 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 and they're like, here, just this is it. This is it. I'm like, no, no, write it all out. Write it all out. Write it all out. And I got it all written out. And even when they wrote it all out, I said, okay, but I'm here to tell you something. If you do not commit to the contract, then I'm here to tell you that this contract is no good. But how many of us live that way? Where we keep giving our word, but our, our word has no weight. Because there's a lack of commitment and that's, that, that, that's rampant everywhere. But it's, it's, it's sad when, when in the church it exists as well. And sometimes just a little bit more in the church than in the world. Because the world is committed to stay unforgiving. The world is committed to stay hateful. The world is committed to stay in debt. The world is committed to divorce. The world is committed to cheat. The world is committed to lie. But, but what does the church look like today? What are we committed to? told you ushers do not let no one out today <laughs> and some of us have uh commit com, com, commit i'll just call it this way commit a virus what does that mean <laughs> let, let me throw some out there maybe maybe you'll you'll uh you'll resonate how about the excuse making anybody have excuse making you ever meet people that just always have an excuse like hey uh why blah 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 blah, blah. oh it's because it's like it's always a because 
Oh, it's all, I meant to do that, but, but, and it's like, they just constantly give you excuses of why they don't commit to their word, why they don't commit to their appearance. And of course, I totally get it. Who wants to be labeled cornflake here? Nobody. Who wants to be labeled lack of commitment, unfaithful, unloyal? Who wants to be, nobody wants to wake up in the morning and say, oh, I'm a cornflake. Nobody wants that. But the reality is this. The reality is, yes, some of us are refusing to face it, that there may be some fear issues. How about this one? How about work faking? Have you ever heard of work faking? Where you look like you're working, you look the part, you dress the part, you talk the part, but you're hardly working at all? It's work faking. You know what? There's a reason why people work fake. You know why? Because they're afraid to make mistakes. Because they're afraid of losing their job. So instead of just improving yourself, being better, Hey, let's just not do nothing. Hey, and everything will be just fine. Kind of like, remember the story of the talents that Jesus spoke about? Remember, he talked about one, he gave how many talents? He gave one, one, y'all know your Bible. What is wrong with you every time I do this? Okay, one guy, he gave one talent. The other guy, he gave how many? Three, Three talents. And the other guy, he gave five. Good job, Elevate Church. <laughs> the guy with the three talents, he did what? He multiplied it. No, he had two talents. The guy with the two talents, the guy with the five talents, he multiplied it. What did the guy with the one talent do? <laughs> Let's put my point back up, please. Leave it up there. Uh, number, yeah, whatever I put. Oh, did I give it to you? I didn't give it to you. What, what, what was it? Uh, I, I, I hardly work. I fake work. You know, he just pretended like, <laughs> yeah, he's hanging out with everybody. But when God came back, when the story of the master comes back, he says, hey, where's... Where's, where's the accounts? We're here to take account. And the other guys are like, well, look, here, what you gave us, we multiplied it here. You can have it back. The guy with the one, what do you call him? You wicked and lazy servant. But I was afraid. That's what happens. Didn't that what he said? I was afraid. And there's a lot of employees that are afraid to be excellent because they're afraid to lose their job. I think Christians should be the most excellent employees and employers on planet earth. How about you? Okay, how about this one? How about vow forgetting? Huh? Vow forgetting like, like you get touched like no fear in November. Yes. Hashtag no miss church in November. Yes. And, and, and yeah, hashtag breaking up with fear. Yes. And you're like, yes, I'm in it. Thank you. I'm so in. That's it. I'm done with fear. But then we, we, we kind of like go along and we start attending church. We're, we got a better attitude. We're serving again. And then all of a sudden you get like spiritual amnesia. Like, what am I doing right now? And, and, and we forget our vow. And before you know it, you're already making excuses again. And you're back to your old self, your fearful self. And we just stay there, and we default, and we default. How about this one, job quitting mentality? Huh? You got people, I get it, like Christmas right now, there are stores that are hiring for seasonal employees, right? But dang, some Christians, they live like seasonal all year long. It's like changing jobs, like changing underwear, just like constant, just new job, new job. And, and here, here's what I've seen. I've seen this job quitting thing, and it's, it, it gets bigger now because obviously the economy is doing good, so that means there's a lot of jobs. So, so people, they just keep... You know, quitting jobs because they want the next, you know, extra dollar, the next extra dollar. But notice that everyone's going for the dollar, but no one has commitment. That's the challenge with our world. And so they have this mindset like, well, this job isn't good. And, and the people there are toxic. And I can't stand my boss. And, and I just can't handle the pressure. Well, listen, wake up. Pressure is everywhere. It's called work. It's called work. And in work, there's pressure. If you want to improve, there's pressure. If you want to reach further, there's pressure. If you want to go higher, if you want to make more money, more money, more problems, more money, more blessings, more people, more problems, more people, more blessings. And so we have to understand the logistics of these wonderful things. Ah, oh, this is one of my favorite ones. Definitely make sure you lock these doors. Ready? <laughs> Church shopping. Church shopping. I'm not really feeling it yet, Pastor. Okay, how long have you been here? It's been a year. Oh, okay. You're still not feeling it, huh? You know, no, no, you know, it's a lack of commitment. It's having that mindset, well, I'm keeping my options. They won't say it, but I already know. I'm keeping my options open. 
You know, because I want to make sure I have a simple exit. You know, I don't want to be too committed because then people start liking me. And then when I leave, they're going to be like, where'd you go? And so there's like this church shopping spirit <laughs> that, that goes around Christian church. And, and listen, I get it. There's times where you have to, you have to change churches. And there's, this is where I feel the only reason. When the church is no longer progressing, it's not reaching its God divine vision and mission and seeing lives changed and transformed and, and souls aren't being won. I get that. There's times for that. But if it's just because I don't feel, I'm just not, I'm just not feel. I'm just waiting. I'm waiting. And because something, but there may be a new church that opens up in the next year and a half. So let's, that's the problem with our culture today. Society has conditioned us to always have an option B. No, not with God. Can you imagine if, I mean, perfect example, Jesus, Jesus, he's, he's on the cross, right? And he's, he's up there and he's taking the sin of the world. He's taking your sin, my sin. And listen, our sin, it's not like just an oopsie. To God, it's, it's painful. It hurts him. It literally, it, it, it tormented his body. Obviously, we know that because when we saw Jesus at the garden, man, he was in like this pain. And he hadn't even been on the cross yet. And he was just right there just trying to ask God if it's possible for you to remove this cup from me. Can we just go ahead and skip this part of the whole salvation package? And But then Jesus said, but not my will. Let your will be done, God. I'll do whatever it is you want. And we know that he's on the cross. And he's right there. Can you imagine if Jesus wasn't feeling it? Like he's like, forget this. This hurts. He just jumped off the cross like, ow. Your sin hurts, man. Yours is a little bit too much. I, I, I don't know if I can do your sin. And, and let's say he started telling God, you know what, God? I'm just not feeling it. I'm just, you know, it hurts too much. Can we just like, you know, can we change it? Like instead of being on a cross, can, can I just lay on a bench or something? You know, can we? But so many of us, we just, we alter everything and because it's uncomfortable and, and because it's painful. I mean, have you ever asked yourself the question, uh, I wonder what it would be like if, if my God, was not committed. I mean, because you and I, we have an expectation for God to show up. We expect God to show up for our family, for our children, for our finances, for our health. Like, I mean, we got like, God, you better do this, this. But, but, but what about us? Where, where's our commitment? Where, where is the commitment of the church? Where is the commitment of God's people? And we have to understand this too. Commitment started from the very beginning, from the book of Genesis. What, how did that start? Well, let's start with a verse. Read this with me. I want you to read Psalms 37, verse 5 with me. It says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do it. Let's read that again. I know it's a cuss word in church. I know. I know. I know. It hurts. Let's say it again. Ready? One, two, three. Commit your way to Trust in him, and he will do it commit your way to who the lord and trust in him and he will do it who's going to do it he will do it so commitment starts with god and it ends with god for he who has begun a good work in you he will complete it so think about this. So God got this ball rolling of commitment since the beginning when Adam and Eve, they established an, an intimate relationship. God, God was committed to Adam and Eve. You guys are Adam and Eve. Committed to them. And he said, hey, let's, uh, let's establish that I'm committed to you. And they also established, well, God, we're committed to you too. How do I know that? Well, God established the commitment by giving them a garden called Eden. He said, here, tend the garden. Keep the garden. You can have everything. But out of everything you see here, there's only one tree I don't want you to touch. I don't want you to touch the mango tree. Don't touch it. You can have everything else, but you don't touch that tree. And so that was a commitment. How many know that when God gives you a promise, he'll also test your commitment? See, a lot of us don't like to be tested in our commitment. We just want the promise. But guess what? 
Anytime God gives you a promise, a land, a, a career, a, a calling, a finally a divine purpose that you understand and you finally discover because you all have one, there's a testing that comes with that commitment. But while God is testing your commitment, Satan is tempting your commitment. How do we know that? Well, Eve's having a conversation with the devil. She's just walking, chilling out, doing her thing, tending, you know, the plants. Adam's calling name lion, elephant, <laughs> bear, tiger, cheetah. Right. Did, did he not name the animals? Okay. No, your word. And, you know, she's daisy, lilies, snake. What the heck do you want? What do you want? And he started having a conversation. And he began to contradict her faith with fear and he said you know what I don't know <laughs> maybe what you thought you heard maybe it's not really what he meant because you know what you know what what a lack of commitment does it finds loopholes to get out that's what that's what it does it looks for a loophole how can I get out of this one that's a lack of commitment <laughs> and so he comes and he says hey maybe what he meant was don't eat the whole tree, girl. Come on, man. You may get some pounds. He, maybe he meant just eat one piece of the fruit. Maybe it wasn't don't touch the whole thing. You know what I'm saying? Maybe it was like, hey, don't be greedy. Just, just try a piece. Uh, we, we look for the loopholes. And then we know what happens, right? God kept his commitment. You know what his commitment was to them? He showed up every single day, and he walked with them in the cool of the garden every day and hung out with them. And we already know what happens. We know that Eve took the bite, and then she got her husband. And when her husband should have been leading, he took the bite too, right? And then the baby was born. It was an awesome thing. But check this out. So they, they, they both took from this. They... they what the first Adam should have conquered, the second Adam, Jesus, overcame. And that's the beauty of God. That when, when God wants to accomplish something in your life, God will, will find every day. He will commit to making sure that you get every single word that you need to hear. He will deliver every single assignment that you need to receive in order for you to accomplish the very purpose that he has called you to do. But that takes commitment that takes being responsible and so when he says commit your way to the lord trust in him and he will do it here's what he's saying he's like hey listen he understands the issues we have i, I think i was starting to think about like all the different things of why people are afraid to commit and and i can come up with a whole bunch i really can but you know what i i, I just I, I i boiled it down to one issue I think the reason that most people are afraid to commit is the only reason that they don't, which is, I've been hurt before. Come on, you've been hurt in, in marriage. You've been hurt in relationships. You've been hurt in friendships. You've been hurt in church. You've been hurt at work. You've been hurt here. You've been hurt. And so what happens is that hurt then begins to develop. Remember, we... It's not the future we're afraid of. It's the past experience that we're afraid of, right? We just listened to part two. But, but I'm here to tell you that I, I truly believe that the reason most Christians are afraid to commit is because they've been hurt. Because who wants to be hurt again? Who wants to go through that pain again? Why would I want to get married again? Why, why would I want to go ahead and partner with someone in business again? Why would I want to trust those girls again? Why would I want to go ahead and hook up with those people? I may get hurt again. And then we start having these fearful conversations in our head of the what if, which then puts you in the place of, 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 of being paralyzed with this fear. And then you can never experience the fullness of God. Here's the truth. That's why he says trust in him and he'll do it our problem the reason that we stay stuck in fear is because we keep trusting man and man will always fail you but God will never fail you and we're all like amen hallelujah short out we even pray in tongues and all that and you know what happens and you know what and then we default back to the same thing we're still mad at man we're still hurt at man we are still holding grudges at man we're still unforgiving at man and then we wonder why are we not free that's why God said, hey, listen, he, he was very clear. He's like, my way, 
and trust me. My way and trust me. And too many of us, we have our way and trust others. And then we get hurt. But let me, let me give you a truth. If you're going to be a committed follower of Jesus Christ, you should already right now give yourself permission to get hurt. You can't, you can't say I'm committed and never be hurt. That's a lie. I mean, okay, how many married people do I have here? Has your spouse ever hurt you? Lift your hand high. Oh, don't. Show. The women are like, let, let, I'll tell you. We've all hurt each other. Okay, has your boss ever hurt you? Lift your hands. Your boss ever hurt you? <laughs> I've been hurt. Ha, ha, have your friends, any of your friends ever hurt you? Yes. Has a family member ever hurt you? Yes. Well, guess what? But you're still committed to them. So you can't say, I'm committed, but I don't want to hurt God. God's like, are you crazy? When my son was committed and willing and ready to die for your sins and the world's sins and lay them up on the cross, he stayed committed to the end. And God's saying, I'm expecting the same from you. He God's saying, I've established my commitment to you. Now you establish yours to me. Commit your way to God. Trust also in him and he will do it. Well, the reason that a lot of things haven't been done yet is because we commit for a moment and then we default back to lack of commitment. We forget our vows. I'm going to go to church this year. Someone's wrote that. I'm going to be in church more time. Man, there's less times than you were last year. It's true, but it's, I'm, I'm proud. I have to say this. I'm proud of you. We have had record number attendance now for three weeks in a row. Give yourselves a big hand. It's been amazing. Like, literally, it's been amazing. You know why? Because you and I, we desire commitment to God. We desire to grow in God. We all desire to want to get a little bit closer to God. We all desire to, to, to improve just a little, bit, a little bit more in our walk with God. There has been such a shift and change in this church. It's been amazing, and I love it. But you got to understand that part of commitment uh, requires some hurt. And you have to just say, okay, so uh, I'm, I'm going to get hurt at church. Anyone ever been hurt at church? Yeah, of course you all don't want to say it here, huh? We've all been hurt at church. Some of you have hurt me. And you're still here. But I'm not going to let it stop my commitment with what I have for God. Same thing. It happens. Where there's people, there's an opportunity to forgive. An opportunity to forgive. To let it go. All right, let me give you a definition of commitment real quickly. Look at this. Commitment means to pledge yourself to a stance. Everybody say, pledge yourself. Look at your neighbor and be like, pledge yourself already, will you? <laughs> it means to pledge yourself to a stance no matter what the circumstance. Say that again, no matter what the circumstance. See, and you just can't find that. It, listen, I don't care how amazing Christians are. It is hard to find believers in this culture, in this society, to take a stand no matter what circumstance happens. It's, it's rare. I mean, come on, tell me how many friends do you have in your little fingers that you can say, like, man, this friend will stand with me no matter what the circumstances. Anybody got like one or maybe half a finger? I don't know. <laughs> it's rare. It's rare to find good employees it's rare to find good leadership it's rare to find great fa it's rare it's rare why because there's this spirit of fear that just keeps stealing from us and taking from us it's rare and so commitment means to pledge yourself to a stance no matter what the, no matter what i will not be moved i will not be shaken i'm not going to stop worshiping god even if everyone in this room stopped worshiping god i'll still show up to church on sunday if only one person showed up Do you have that kind of stance? Because that's the kind of stance commitment requires in whatever circumstance you're in. There's a lot of faithful Christians. The moment something happens, uh, they get freaked out. And it's not to make fun of people, but they do. They get freaked out. Listen, that's building character. If you don't pass the test, you're going to retake it again. 
So it's time to start passing some tests because God is testing your commitment because God wants to give you the promised land. God wants to bless you with those things you, that you've been believing him for. But sometimes it's not that God hasn't blessed you. God hasn't given it to you. It's just that you haven't stayed long enough for, for, for you to see the blessing of God. I'm telling you, uh, this is not just, you know, information. This is, this, is, this is stuff that we have lived as a church, as a family here. We've seen the goodness of God. We've seen when people wanted to stay away from this church by the dozens just because of our city name or just because of the culture or creed. Oh, New Hall is a Hispanic community. So, so people start sizing up the church because it's a Hispanic community. Last time I checked, we all bleed the same. It's called red. So we lack commitment. <laughs> they don't look like me. They don't talk like me. That'll jack up some stereotypes. Hey, but let's all be honest. We all got a little bit of stereotype in us. Come on. Don't, let's not lie. All of us do. Huh? Come on. He pledged himself. Jesus pledged himself to a stance no matter what. The, it didn't matter how much it hurt him. He said, man, for them, I'm going to do this. All right, let's get out of here quickly. Let me give you uh, four ways commitment will eat fear for breakfast. Are you guys ready? Here you go. Number one, don't be involved, commit. Say it with me. Don't be involved, commit. The difference between involvement and commitment is like an eggs and ham breakfast. The chicken was involved, but the pig was committed. It's committed. The chicken was like, all right, I'll, I'll lend you some eggs. <laughs> yeah, but I ain't going to die. The pig was like, let's go all in, man. Let's go. That's the difference. It's, listen, when you're, a, when you're a Christ follower, it's, it's funny. You hear people say goofy things like this. You know, the moment I came to God, life got harder. Right? Oh, my God. The moment I just went to that church, all hell broke loose. Like, no, all hell was always breaking loose. You just found out. You were blind, and now you see. Praise God. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> It was always you were blind before it just you just didn't know it and now you come to the truth and and God shows you and he reveals himself to you in a raw real way because he's ready to test your commitment and now it gets a little bit hard and you're like ah like Satan does they get afraid ah. well, I, he, he was, Benny did a great job didn't he man so so when you want your life with God to succeed you invest yourself in him fully you must fully and let's be honest some of us that have been in this church for a while you're awesome you're great but you know you're not fully committed you're not and that's not to be mad at anybody i love all of you you know i will stop everything for you You know that especially my core team my core leader i will do anything for you but let's be honest sometimes you know what even i could be in that place where god wants to do something now but maybe even i'm not fully committed to go like god i'm already doing like a million things god what's up Can we just, can we talk real? Because if not, then we're just going to church and just singing great songs, a wonderful hymn, and then we leave and nothing changes. Come on. You cannot afford to be an involved person. You must be committed. Involved says something like this. Have you ever met a Christian or someone? More, I'll just use me as an example. And this happened recently. Yeah, so, um, hey. So what do you do, what do you do for a living? I, I, I'm a, I'm a, I hate saying it, but I'm a pastor. Because, you know, that, people always act weird with me. When I, the moment I say, like, I'm cool, like, we're having a conversation. I was getting my hair did, right, get it done. And the guy's like, hey, so we're having, like, a great conversation. It was amazing. And he's like, so what do you do for a living? Uh, I'm a pastor. And it's like everything just went quiet. Like, I'm like, oh. like, dang, bro, this dude didn't talk to me no more. I'm like, I'm like, man, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like hey, well, do you go to church? He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I go to church. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Like, like, like where do you go to church? Uh, you know, the Lutheran uh, of the Calvary of the Chapel of the, yeah, like all these names. Like, oh, okay, that's awesome. That's awesome. What's the pastor's name? We're not connected. Oh, okay, you're not connected. But it's, it's interesting how people will say they're involved, but there's no commitment. And that's what the church looks like today. There's a lot of involved Christians. They know about Jesus. They've heard about Jesus. They love Jesus. 
they believe in what Jesus believes, but they're just involved with Jesus versus I'm committed with Jesus. It's a big difference, isn't it? So are you the chicken or the pig? Neither. Neither. <laughs> neither. Say neither. Look at this. Nehemiah 2.2. I love, I, love, I love Nehemiah's vulnerability because he says, I was very much afraid. I love this. So listen, I get it. We're all going to have a form of, there is healthy fear and there's toxic fear. We've talked about that. Nehemiah's being very vulnerable. He's like, God, I was, I'm very much afraid of what you're telling me. Because if you know the story of, of Nehemiah, I'll give you a breakdown. He was already committed to a workplace. He had a job. He had a responsibility. As a matter of fact, this season that, that, that Nehemiah was serving a king, okay, as his cupbearer, um, this was a time of exile. So this was like a benefit and an opportunity for him. And now God comes right when he is comfortable in exile. And he says, hey, Nehemiah, I need you to do something for me. I need you to go and I need you to rebuild the, the, the broken walls of Jerusalem, the ones that are burnt down and see the temple that's inside. I need you to build, rebuild that for me, will you? And Nehemiah's like, uh, I'm afraid. The issue is not being afraid. The issue is the obedience. The issue is, will you do it afraid? And so he, because like I said last week, a lot of us, we have conversations in our head. Because when you're afraid, like all of us are, at some point when you're about to do something scary for God, you start, you start thinking of the worst case scenarios. Nehemiah's thinking probably like, dang, but what if he chops my head off when I tell him? He's working it. Kings weren't nice back then. They will, they will cut you up. Like, there's the, the I'll cut you, this, this, this culture, and then there's, the, I'll cut you. And they would cut you in that culture. So just think, man, if I go tell him what God just told me, man, I wonder what he's going to say. He's going to, they're going to kill me. He's going to hang me. He's going to chop my head off. But what if I don't obey God? I wonder, like, what's more convenient to, to just, just send a little bit of help or to do what God is asking me to do, and that is to rebuild. He didn't say support financially the rebuilding of the wall. He said go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and go and rock it out. And so he finally goes, and you know, and that just shows you. You know, a hardworking Christian, you can tell, you can tell who they are. You know how you, you can tell who they are? When the bosses or the managers or the owners take more interest of your sadness and ask you, what's going on? Are you okay? You know why? Because those are the people that are excellent employees. Who wants to see their best of their best employees looking down? Who? So he says to Nehemiah, what's wrong with you, man? Well, uh, well uh, there were some guys that spoke to me, and they were telling me about the the broken walls of Jerusalem. Then I heard God, and he said to me, rebuild the walls. <laughs> and I, I just, I, I know I have to do this. This is what God has placed on my life. Uh, I've, never, I've never done this before. All I've ever done was do the cupbearer work for you, king. I have, I have no, no background in construction. I've, I've, I've never led a massive army. I, I have no skill set. I have no diplomas. I have no degrees. I only have a word from heaven. And, and, and by the way, can, can you pay for it? Can I get your black card, your platinum card, please? <laughs> oh, and while you're at it, can I get a letter for me too? And can you seal it and stamp it so that every single uh, country I step forward or every person I come that's in authority, the moment I show them the letter, I want them to know that I have your approval, your validation. Would you do that for me? And the king was like, and I'm sure he was like, and he said, sure, let's do it. Yeah. We'll do it. See, you know what gets me? Is that I see so many people say things like that. I'm like, hey, man, where have you been? Oh, I work on Sundays, Pastor. I'm like, okay, that's cool, man. All right. Please listen to me. This is not to mock you. How many think that God cares about even the littlest things of your life? Okay. The only reason you can come Sundays or the only reason you can be committed to, to serve God the way you would like to, because I know everyone desires to serve God in some way, it's not that you can or... Or that you won't. That's not the issue. It's the fear of saying, my company does not give me Sundays off. I get it. Been there, done that. I haven't always been in ministry. I, was, I wasn't always a pastor, guys. 
I was in management. And I'll never forget the day that I was in my VCOM meeting, which is all video. This is before all the technology was on because I worked for a tech, a tech company. It was huge. We were already way advanced in technology. And I'll never forget when the owner came. He said, uh, from this moment forward, no management, none will have Sundays off. And I'll never forget, it resounded in my head. And I thought, wait a minute, but I go to church, man. I got a family. I got kids. I'm thinking that, but of course, I have a responsibility. And you know what I did? I, under, under the breath, I said, Father, I thank you that though they're saying this, I'm going to believe you that you, it says, the Bible says this, that the heart of the king is in his hand, and he moves it where he wants it. And I said, God, would you move on me? And I wish I could tell you that, like, the following weekend, he came back and said, guess what, guys? Y'all get weekends off. Well, that didn't happen. Or a month later. Or three months later. One year later of just praying, God, I want my Sundays. God, I want my Sundays. One year later, the owner comes back into the main conference room via television in all the company, which was a grip of stores. And he says, we have changed our mind. We are now giving all management has Sundays off. And I'm here to tell you something. The only reason that we're probably not seeing the blessings or seeing the things that we desire is because we're not willing to pledge and stand and believe for something greater than we're already doing. There's no other reason. Nehemiah is a perfect example. That's why I gave you Nehemiah. <laughs> He already had a job. Why would the king want to give him permission to go serve God? See, we have excuses. Well, in my company, they just, that'll never happen. That's because you've pledged yourself that it will never happen. Instead of pledging yourself, but what could happen? Does that make sense? Number two. Is that a good point? I am on number two, right? Oh, yeah, but look at what Nehemiah 4, 6 says. So we rebuilt the wall, completing it halfway up because the people were what? Committed. The people were what? You mean you have to be committed to work hard and see big things? Yes. The people were what? Committed to working. Look at what ne the NIV version says. It says, so we rebuilt the wall till all of it. Everybody say till all of it. Oh. Come on, man, till all of it reached half its height for the people worked with all their they worked with all of their heart they didn't work with half their heart a piece of their heart a third of their heart they were all in it's amazing how many people in church please guys i'm telling you this is the world of course but I, i'm talking to christians it's amazing how many christians are will be with you but not all they're not all in with you we got to change that it says they all worked with all of their heart until it was what? Finished. They finished it. They didn't start it and quit. They finished it. They finished the work. Some of you have yet to finish some things. And you have defaulted back to your fear. And you need to get back to your design, faith. And finish what God gave you to do. What was the last thing God told you to do out of obedience that you started and stopped? Finish it. What vow did you give God that you have yet to finish? Finish it. And he'll bless you. And then number two, if you want to learn how to commit, someone else will. If you want to learn how to commit, someone else will. That means that there's someone out there who knows everything you know, and they're probably not God's first choice, but neither were you. Some of you were like God's third choice because the first two didn't want to do it. But I wonder if you're living in a place where God chose you, but you're too afraid to go for it now because you're defaulting back to what you know. And you know what we know more is fear. So we lack the commitment to go all in for it. And so, if you won't learn how to commit, someone else is going to come in. Adam and Eve, okay, they may have filled in the first garden, right? The first Adam, he missed it. The second Adam, Jesus, in the second ar a a a garden of Gethsemane, he nailed it. So God wants us to nail some things this year. Not 2019, like, oh, this is great, Pastor. I'm going to start on January 1st. No, we're going to start, like, right now. You remember the cards I asked you to fill out? A lot of us, probably 90% of us never even did it. 
It's, it's, it's the truth. You know why? Because it takes work to assess yourself. Let me give you the acronym of fear. <laughs> acronym of fear. Look at this. Frantic effort, avoid reality. It's a frantic, frantic effort to avoid reality. We're more afraid to address it. So we go in, in this frantic mode to avoid the truth. The truth is that until you assess your fears, until you address your fears, you will never progress beyond your fears. We've got to face the music. We've got to face the reality. Number three, never give up. Never give in. Say it with me. Never give up. Never give in. Daniel, perfect example. Here you have Daniel. He, he was the, the prophet for a very wicked king named King Darius. And King Darius was obviously uh, uh, someone that was driven by the people around him. It was very political in his time, obviously. He had people that were always getting him to sign decrees. And, and here's what I tell people that are all into politics. Stop getting weird. Listen, we get so weird about like, oh, my God, the Republicans, we lost the house. Oh, the, 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 the Democrats. We, you know what? Do you think God's pacing in heaven like, oh, my God, what are we going to do? I mean, do you think, let them, how many think God's worried right now? How many think God is worried right now? You think God's worried about who's in authority? You think God would allow anyone to be an authority that he didn't already allow to be an authority? I mean, look, here you have Daniel. He's serving the most, one of the most wicked kings. That's the problem with the churches. We need people from the body to be in government. We need people from the body to be in the entertainment industry. We need people from the body to be in music. We need people from the body to be in medicine. We need the body so that we can be that prophet, so we can be that voice for the wicked kings, so that we can change their hearts. And so there's this constant battle with Christian on oh, the Democrat. Oh, like, look at, God's not pacing. If he ain't worried, I ain't worried. You know what God's worried about? Our commitment. <laughs> not that he's worried, but you know what I mean. What concerns him, what concerns God is our commitment, our lack of commitment. That's what concerns him. And does, Trump doesn't concern him. The Democrats don't concern him. The Republicans don't concern God. God's like, hey, listen. I got some people rising up. I got people in-house. I got, I, got, I got faithful people in there you guys don't even know about. God's not worried about that, but we get all freaked out. So here you have Daniel. Daniel is, in, is, is excelling in his position and wonderful things. And I get the worship team come up. Let's get out of here. We, we, we see Daniel. He's excelling at all of his duties. He's excelling at his work. Even that wicked king looks at Darius and says, man, this dude is awesome. And he tells Darius, you know, Darius, we're going to go ahead and we are going to promote you, man. I'm going to give you some authority because I like, I like your style. I mean, we're talking about this man was a, ma a man who fasted and prayed, who was, you know, committed to God. And, and though Darius didn't believe in his God, but Darius respected what he believed in. You know why? Because he saw a man who knew how to pledge himself. And so, of course, the politicians come around like, dang, how come he gets that position? How come I don't get to be governor? And so they all start hating on him. And so they tricked the king, Darius, and they said, hey, Darius, why don't we change the game up? And Darius is like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you know, right now everyone's free to worship all their gods, right? Yeah. He's like, how about we create an image of you and you will be their god? And Darius is like, that's a good idea. Let's do it. And so he signed the decree, and he made a decree that anyone who worshiped any other god but him would be thrown into the lion's den. See, that tested Daniel's heart. See, God placed Daniel in a place of promotion, but now God was testing that promotion. Look at the scripture here. Put my verse up, please. And Daniel found out that the king had signed the order. In spite of that, he did just as he had always done before. Look, this is what you do when you get bad news. This is what you do when you get good news. He went home to his upstairs room. Its windows opened toward Jerusalem. He went to his room three times a day to pray. He got down on his knees and gave thanks to his God. And some of the other royal officials, the haters, went to where Daniel was staying. They saw him praying, and they saw him asking God for help. And, you know, they went over there, King Darius, King Darius, guess, guess what just happened? Why? Daniel went right back to what he always does. He is firm. He is standing. He's, 
he, that boy will not change whom he serves. He ain't worshiping you. And you know what? When we go through stuff, you know what we worship? We worship our fear. We worship our doubts. We worship our unbelief. We worship, I don't have this. We worship, worship. Daniel said, dang, Darius, why would you do that? All right, let me go do what I always do. Let me go kneel and pray. See, because he knew that when he kneels, that's when unlimited power comes. And so Darius had no choice. He said, Daniel, I'm sorry, man. I'm about to throw you in the lion's den. Daniel's like, all right. But Darius said, but I'm sure the God that you worship, let's hope he saves you. And so it says, uh, verse 16, please. So the king gave the order. Daniel was brought out and thrown into the lion's den. And the king said to him, you always serve your God faithfully. You always serve your God, what? Committed. So may he save you. A few days later, <laughs> King Darius, because he liked Daniel, he was like, because oh, oh, he sealed it, closed it. He's in the den of the lions. <laughs> he goes and he has the, the seal removed after three days. And he, he's like, Daniel! Daniel. And Daniel's like, hey, king, what's up? The king's like, what the? Hey, Daniel, the lions didn't eat you? He's like, no, nah, man, they tried to eat my chicken leg, but God shut the mouth of the lion. God shut the mouth of the lion. And the king was so moved because he finally saw someone who served their God faithfully and committed, and he saw that his prayers were more powerful than anything or anyone that was trying to influence him. And he wrote another decree. He said, bring me them fools that came and made me do the first decree, and let's go ahead and throw them in the line. Then they threw those guys, those, you know. So here's what he's saying. Stop trying to defend yourself. Let God take care of the haters. And then you know what those haters, they got eaten up. Boom, they ate them up. And then the king said, for now on, we read a new decree. Anyone who worships any God must worship the God of Daniel. I wonder what if the church, what if the church, what if, what if people were committed in praying like you're committed? I wonder what would happen with the church if people were committed to reading their Bible like you read your Bible. I wonder what the church would look like if they were committed to serve the way you serve God. I wonder what the church would look like if they were committed to volunteer the church the way you volunteer. I wonder what the church would look like if you were committed to love the way you love. I wonder what the church would look like if we were all committed to building the church because there's a famous quote in the Bible that was made by, by Jesus and he said and I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it as long as I'm building the church the gates of hell have no have no power see commitment starts with God and it finishes with God God saves you and one day you and I stand before him. But God is looking for a faithful, committed church. Amen. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.